You're listening to Film Seizure. This is Jeff. And this is Jason. And you can catch us on Wednesdays weekly talking about some new, some sort of movie. Yeah. <laughs> you can also find us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Just search for Film Seizure. And uh, as Jason said, check us out each week. Yes. Your Wednesdays should be less crappy because of us, we hope. <laughs> Maybe. Or more Maybe, crappy. Or more crappy. Who knows? Either which way. Wednesdays are always a crap shoot. Why not give us a try? Exactly. <laughs> Can't say it any better than that. <laughs> Who's buried in Midian? Ain't nothing but dead folk. Somewhere. <laughs> hidden from sight. <laughs> closer than you might think. <laughs> is a place that's not on any map. Midian. Something's breeding there. It looks a lot like hell. But they call it home. Hey, hey, welcome to another episode of Film Seizure. This is Jeff Arbuckle. This is Jason Oliver. And uh, we're going to be wrapping up our Barker Bonanza. Barker Bonanza! Boy, this has been fun. This has been a good one, yeah. and uh, we're not quite done with Barker yet. Nope. Uh, but we'll we'll that's that's for later to to discuss. But yeah, I think um, you'll all probably realize there's a glaring omission <laughs> in our Barker Bonanza. So um, but we're don't worry, we're gonna do those. We're gonna get around to it. We're getting around to it. We we but we're saving it for a special occasion. Exactly. Uh, but uh, to be honest with you, this is probably the the special occasion for you. Yes. Uh, so this week we are talking about the 1990, uh, written and directed by Clive Barker, Nightbreed. Nightbreed. This is, oh boy, yeah, this one is my, my favorite. Yeah, so um, why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, let, let's, talk, let, let's talk about Nightbreed. What is Nightbreed? What's it about? And uh, just kind of give us the, the, the overview, and we'll dive in a little bit deeper. Yeah, so, I mean, man, there is so much to talk about with this movie. Um, and it's pretty timely in the sense that um, there's some there's a lot of new footage that's come to light in recent years and different cuts of the film, and we'll talk about all of that. But, but um, before we do, Nightbreed is, at its heart, a movie where the monsters are the good guys. It's, it's humans versus monsters. And uh, as Clive Barker says in the intro to the director's cut, uh, traditionally in, in, in films and movies, the monsters, um, they've been uh, beat, beat, them up, beat them up and burn them, you know? Like they're the bad guys and they're, they're mindlessly bad. They don't have any dimension to them. And this is a movie that kind of turns that on its head. And it's about um, the monsters uh, with, with stories to tell and, and, and sympathetic beings that are just trying to survive in a in a you know in a world that that wants to destroy them. So um, so what we have is a story about um, about a man uh, who has always been sort of drawn to these stories that he's heard about this place called Midian, where the monsters live, and um, his journey to to join um, the tribes of the moon, as they call themselves, and 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 kind of. The, the prophecy of, of him kind of becoming their destructor, destructor and their savior. So um, uh, we'll get into all, all of that, but um, I kind of want to just kind of start with kind of talking a little bit about when I first saw this movie. Um, for me, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of those movies I remember seeing the, for, the, for the very first time and just being totally struck by how different and cool and scary but but exhilarating it was um we used to go to um visit my my family in scranton pennsylvania we'd either go at thanksgiving time or we'd go at uh, the summertime for usually like a week and i would stay in the basement of my my aunt's house and in the basement there was like a couch and a tv and i would usually stay up really freaking late and i'd watch <laughs> the late night cable sure. down there uh as as one is wont to do i also remember whenever we would stay at thanksgiving time um, Nickelodeon used to always have um, a marathon of Ren and Stimpy and <laughs> Rocco's Modern Life for like the whole weekend of Thanksgiving. I used to watch the shit out of that. <laughs> but this particular night, um, I was just watching, I don't know if it was on TNT or TBS or one of those, you know, cable channels. Um, and uh, I think the same night they were airing the uh, George A. Romero remake of Night of the Living Dead 
with oh, Tony the, Todd the, and yeah the, yeah, the color remake. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The one. I, yeah. Tony Todd. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd seen that for the first time, and I really liked that. And that's one I, I think we should talk about at some point. Maybe even pair it with the original. But I remember seeing that, and then funny enough, they showed like a short film, and it was Night of the Living Bread, <laughs> and it was just like this really goofy parody, black and white version of of Night of the Living Dead, but all the zombies were were flying pieces of toast. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then Nightbreed came on. And I was just totally blown away by this thing. It was, it was in a time in my life when uh, I was probably you know twelve or so when I saw this, and um, and monster movies still scared me. You know, Freddy Krueger scared me, Jason Voorhees scared me, Michael Myers terrified me. But this was a movie where the the monsters were were scary at first, but then you came to to understand their plight and understand where they're coming from and see them from their point of view and it was sort of a turning point for me in in kind of how I viewed horror films Mm -hmm. right plus the fact that it was just I mean man the last act in this movie is just balls of the walls monster (laughs) monster battle warfare like it's just it's just so exhilarating and fun um but yeah so I've always kind of had this affinity for this movie and it's one of those movies where um when you talk to people about movies, which you're want to do, especially someone like me and Jeff, who, who grew up in or, or you know spent our our youthful working years in movie theaters and oh, yeah. uh, and video stores, you know you meet people in those places and you talk about movies. And when you talk to somebody who knows and loves Nightbreed, it's an instant kinship. <laughs> it really is. There, there, we're like the 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 um, clans of the moon. You know, it's like it's a uh, it's it's yeah it's a brotherhood. Well, it's kinship. It's, it's a kinship. Yeah. yeah. So so yeah so, you know that I've always kind of really really loved this movie and then it's an amazing story and we'll get to it in a little bit but this movie has kind of found a new life in the last few years. It's it's there's almost been what you would call a movement, uh, if you will, to get some of this extra new footage out and some of these new cuts of the film. And I want to tell that story, but um, I do want to kind of pass it over to Jeff and just kind of get his impressions yeah. of, of this. Because, I mean, Jeff saw this for the first time tonight. Yeah. And that was super cool to, to like, <laughs> share this with him. Yeah. I uh, Yeah. So I hadn't seen this before. I may have seen bits and pieces. I certainly recognize the cover, um, you know, with them all standing, you know, mm-hmm. that... It's it's, oh, it's like the superhero pose almost. It's, you it's you almost, see it like yeah. in the Avengers, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of. And, um, you know, it's like I certainly have recognized some of the characters, like the porcupine lady yeah. and, uh, and, the, and the serial killer that's going around with the bag on his head. Now, some of that, I do admit, also comes from seeing covers of this comic book. To yes. the comic series for Nightbreed. A- absolutely. Uh-huh. Um, so I, I guess we can talk about that real quick. Sure. Um, Clyde Barker, uh, kind of a, a man after my own heart, is a big fan of comic mm-hmm. books, particularly uh, he did very much like superhero books and stuff yep. like that. And so, you know, a lot of his movies or a lot of his uh, stories were at some point in time turned into a comic book yep. series. There's, I mean, there's... Uh, I think even to this day, there's still a Hellraiser series. I think you're right. Uh, with Boom Studios, and they've done some Nightbreed comics. Yep. Rawhead Rex was brought in. Um, and so, you know, he and he actually, for a little while, had his own imprint at Marvel, where he told stories. And fortunately, it was during a, a kind of a bad time for Marvel and probably did not get the life it deserved. But, um, but so... Uh, yeah, so I mean, there are certain things that I that I recognize, maybe not directly from the movie, but from some of the comic books that came out later. Yeah. Um, now, uh, I have to admit that you know this this came out within a couple of years of another movie that I constantly get this movie confused <laughs> with, and that's Stephen King Sleepwalkers. <laughs> uh, for whatever reason, Nightbreed and Sleepwalkers, I always thought it's like oh. One of them's about the cat people. It's like Warlock and Witchcraft, right? <laughs> or Witchboard. Was it Witchboard? No, Witchcraft. Uh, witchcraft. <laughs> Witchcraft's got them titties in it. <laughs> no, um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, uh, so. Well, you've probably always heard horrendous things about sleepwalkers. 
that and I I remember the the trailer because that was another one of those th- you know I've talked about it before where it's like E used to have the the trailer show yeah, yeah. late at night yeah uh, before I went to bed in um, Sleepwalkers was constantly on there because that was about that same time that that show first started mm-hmm. that they were advertising stuff like that so anyway um, so yeah so this was the first time I saw it and you know it's it's an interesting movie I. It, there are two different versions of the movie that are most commonly known. We watched the director's cut and I'm really kind of glad we did. Yep. Even though I don't think it changed many questions that I have, it does. The version that we watched with the director's cut certainly had the much, much better ending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, I'm, we watched the theatrical cuts ending, and I was utterly confused, and I knew what happened. Yeah. I knew what the end of the story was, and I knew what, what the point was, but I was confused. So, uh, but no, I I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was all right. Yeah, I liked it. <laughs> um, I don't think I could, I, I don't think I liked it as much as Lord of Illusions or um, Candyman, if we look at the movies that we covered this month. Sure. Um, but I certainly see where they were, where he was attempting to go with this and try to build this, uh, this world. Yeah. So, yeah. So Barker, um, what he was, I think there's, he's even said this in print somewhere. Um, this was kind of meant to be his star Wars with monsters. Like he wanted this to launch a franchise and, and um, it had all, all sorts of studio interference. It, the studios didn't get what he was trying to do with monsters as the good guys. They were um, they were just thoroughly confused by by the whole point that Barker was trying to make. And, I think it's also sometimes dangerous to make a monster a good guy. Yeah, uh, especially when their god is Baphomet. Baphomet, yeah, <laughs> yeah. which is a very realistic pagan and, and occult symbol sure um that probably scared the studio that, that will spook him a little bit yeah but i, I mean, mean come on it's in the script i mean it's based on his his short novel cabal mm-hmm. it's not like any of this was a secret you know so sure. so you could definitely get a sense of his frustration it's like look i i wrote this novel i wrote this script and now you're getting you know queasy about the about the material um I, it's it's unfortunate that it it did not get the legs that it probably should have or could have gotten when it was made yeah and uh, it's i kind of feel like you know we we mentioned the comic book element i had said that it kind of felt like a uh kind of almost like an x-men type of universe that was Uh being built because um you know there are these different creatures they each have their own power or ability or whatever and they're trying to keep to themselves because there are people who fear them and yeah. and want to ultimately burn down their fucking homes. Right. Um, but no, I, so I, I think that because these weren't presented as most of them were not presented doing heroic things. All you saw them was in their little monster city with all the, like the shit that's going on around it. Well, they're, they're probably c- scared the studio. Yeah, they're 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 kind of the um, the I know the monster version of the cir- circus freaks. You know, mm-hmm. they're the sideshow, except they um, they haven't been able to even assimilate enough to to be out in the open in any capacity. They're they're so freakish, they're so scorned or so feared that they have to live underground. <laughs> One guy looks like a raw chicken. Yeah. I mean, the monsters are great. I mean, there are probably, I mean, 100, 150 different monsters oh, yeah. in this movie. The, the, and the, the makeup effects in this uh, movie are, are, are beautiful it's, and amazing. It's, it, it is a true, truly just epic um, um, output that, yeah. that, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it, it's, it's kind of flabbergasting. And you get, really get a better sense of that in the director's cut, too, because let's talk about that for a second. There are three cuts of this movie now since 1990 to about 2012 or so um, there was only one cut there was only one known cut it was the theatrical cut it was what Morgan Creek put out in the theaters 
and that's what was on DVD. Um, there was no Blu-ray. There was no nothing. The DVD that did exist was totally bare bones. Uh, the movie had pretty much been disowned by Clive Barker. But there's a lot of people who still really loved the movie because they they understood and they they um, connected with what Clive Barker was trying to, to make. Um, so weirdly enough, um, what kind of happens is uh, there's this little there's this intern. His name is Mark Miller. He works for um, Clive Barker at Seraphim, and um, he had kind of always heard about the the studio interference and that there was this other cut. And he asked Clive Barker about it one day. He's like, "Where is this? Where's the rest of the footage?" And Clive was like, "I have no idea. It's it's in the wind. You know, the Tribes of the Moon. <clears throat> I think I called it Clans of the Moon earlier. I'm going to turn in my Nightbreed card. The <laughs> um, the you know, who knows? It's 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 out there in the world, but maybe or it's destroyed." Um, and he's and Mark Miller kind of asked for permission to sort of maybe hunt this footage down. So um, Clive was like, "Sure, yeah, by all yeah. means, if you can find it, that'd be that'd be great. If you can find it, great. If not, eh. yeah. I, I mean, mean, what do we have to lose? What do we have to lose? Right. So, f- so interestingly enough, they find um, the VHS work print of this of Nightbreed in a storage closet at Clive's house. <laughs> it's unmarked tape. I mean, I can't. Can you imagine? I don't want to see anything I, I, on a Clive I, Barker unmarked tape. Think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Mark Miller is going there through boxes of unmarked tapes, putting it in a VCR. And every time you hit play, it has to be this moment of just exhilaration and terror, right? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> at what point am I going to see somebody's nipple pierced <laughs> by a hook? By a hook. Or, yeah. God, who knows? Like, who the fuck knows what you're going to see? I, I want, man, that's what I would ask Mark Miller if, if I had ever had a drink with him. So, what, what was on the other unmarked tapes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he finds the work print. Um, actually, he finds, I think, various VHS tapes of, um, of footage that was shot and thought to be lost. And, and Clive sees it. It's like, oh, my gosh, yeah, this is, this is you know, really ratty VHS quality footage of, of you know, most of the dailies and takes. And, and it's all there. So um, a friend of Seraphim, a friend of Clive's, Russell Charrington, who I'm not totally sure – his relationship with um, with um, with with Clive and and um, Seraphim, but he is um, they send the footage to him. He's like, I want to see it. I want to see. It. He's a big fan of Nightbreed. He's like, I want to see it. Send it to me. So they send it to him. He watches it. He loves it, and he decides as a gift to Clive and to the world, he's going to create a um, the ultimate cut of of Nightbreed using the DVD footage and the, um, and the, uh, VHS footage with the shooting script and, and create what he feels is the closest he can get to Clive's original vision with, with the materials at hand. So he does, he makes it and he calls it the, the, the cabal cut. So the cabal cut creates quite a stir in, um, the horror film community. Uh, and they decide to, uh, premiere it. They decide to show it at festivals. Uh, I think, Funny enough, it premiered at Horror Hound here in Indianapolis hmm. um, several years ago. Uh, not a year that we went, but man, it would have been cool to see. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, I, I, was gonna, so, I was about to tell a story that we didn't need to tell. So go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is um, the fans see this thing and they're like, "What the what? This is amazing." I mean, it's 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 like you know uncovering gold you know you've you've struck it you've you all of these stories you'd heard about what the story was supposed to be is now kind of coming to light so um you know everybody's kind of demanding that this be released um on video we want they we want this the consumers the fans want to want a, a piece of this they want to own it and um there's a panel uh and, and ann bobby the um uh her lori uh, in the film, she, uh, Boone's girlfriend, she kind of declares, she gets really excited because I think she saw it for the first time too. She gets really, really excited and she kind of dubs um, the Occupy Midian movement. She's like, we need to Occupy Midian to, so that we can, we can get this, um, this released on, on Blu-ray. So what happens is a couple uh, guys create a Facebook page and a website, Occupy Midian, that's sort of a, a center point and rallying point for all of the fans of this movie to kind of come together and um, and demand, you know, to see, you know, a release of this film, uh, this this cabal cut. So what happens instead 
is instead of getting the cabal cut, Mark Miller keeps up his search. And he's getting tips from Clive. Clive essentially gives him his black book, which you imagine all the names that are in that. Oh, my God. <laughs> There's probably drawings of nipples getting hooks through them. <laughs> so call this nipple right here, and that nipple might have the, have the phone number for this nipple. <laughs> And they're all going to have hooks in them. And there's really interesting stories here. I won't get into all of them uh, because I want to be as as brief as I I can with this because there's a lot to talk about. But he eventually, um, they they are calling storage, like film storage facilities. And he calls one and they get back to him. He's like, yeah, we got something labeled Nightbreed. And he's like, oh, you do? And they're like, yeah. And he's like, all right, well, I'm going to go pick it up. At this point, they're not really clear who owns it. Because it could be Morgan Creek, it could be Clive. It's not really clear. It's probably Morgan Creek who owns these this this found film. But what it is is it's not reels. It's um, it's basically clippings of the film. It's all, <laughs> yeah, it's all stuff that was cut out. I mean, it it's was the, it's the it's the um, cutting room floor stuff. Yeah, all yeah. of it. Yeah, and it's boxes of it, like like five or six, I think, small boxes of just of just cut scenes from the film. So. They get this, and they're like, well, this is amazing. We've got all of these, you know, this film, but they don't have any sound. <laughs> so they're thinking, well, we, we want to cut something together. So what they do is they, they hire um, some audio genius to take the sound from the VHS, VHS tapes, and they sync them with the newfound uh, film negatives, and they rescan everything. They cut it in with what they have, um, you know, from the original theatrical, theatrical cut, and they, and they master this beautiful director's cut with mixed audio where there are moments where you can kind of tell but it's pretty phenomenal what they did um and this is clive's vision this was what they with what they had this was the closest they could get to what clive originally wanted and it's it's you could kind of tell from you know hearing him speak about it that he, he he gets pretty nostalgic or not nostalgic he gets pretty um just emotional about the fact that he feels like they had, he's finally kind of can close the book on this one. It's he's achieved what he wanted to achieve artistically with this film. So, um, but what's funny about this. All right. So here's me that I had never heard of the cabal cut. I hear about the cabal cut. I get real excited about the cabal cut. And then I hear that scream factory is going to release the, um, director's cut. Blu-ray director's cut, collector's edition, this beautiful package with both the theatrical and the um, the the um, Blu-ray director's cut. Um, it's very limited. This thing sells really the, the collector's edition portion of this sells very very fast. Um, fans from all over the world are pissed off because it's in region one and they <laughs> can't get you know like you can't get it shipped. I mean, there, there's a lot of there were a lot of hurt feelings from uh, from across the pond because they couldn't get. Um, a copy of this in the region that that they have over there. But regardless of fact, people are super excited. They get it, and they're and they're there are mixed feelings. You watch it, especially people who have, I should say people who have watched the Cabal Cut are like, wait, where's this other stuff? Where's the stuff that I saw on the Cabal Cut? Well, the fact the fact is, Clive shot a lot of stuff. Not all of that stuff was meant to be story elements. Not all of that stuff was meant to be. Um used in any meaningful way like i told jeff the title card in this movie it's really cool it's like the night breed and block letters that come from left to right or sorry from right to left across the screen and there's all of this video footage of monsters behind it yeah and, and, like they're and, having and, like some sort of weird orgy yeah thing going on yeah there. and there, there were hours and hours of just weird monster shit that was filmed that that would that existed out there but was never meant to be a part of the narrative story it was just shot for um for that purpose for that mm-hmm. for that title card right so i think that's fun but people are like well where's the sex scene with Pe- uh, peliquin and shunasasi and where's this and where's that and why did they cut why did they cut out go get them boys from the theatrical cut when boone releases the berserkers you know so there were these there's these complaints from some people like they wanted this totally comprehensive version that that had every single shot that was filmed somehow jammed into a three-hour movie it's like nobody wants to watch that. Nobody. Yeah, I wouldn't have wanted to watch no. that. <laughs> so so, so what I did, what, it was really, I had to make a decision because Jeff had never seen this movie before. And I was like, there are three cuts of this movie. So I, I have the Cabal cut as well. Um, 
that's an interesting story in and of itself. That was never going to get released, but the fans again kind of demanded it. And Seraphim was able to make a deal with Morgan Creek to only release a very, very limited amount of these. They, there was originally only um, 150 copies of the Cabal Cut that were sold. Wow. I got one. Um, and I was super excited. And I'm still very <laughs> excited. Uh, and then they realized, well, they had to basically order 1,000 because that was the, 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 the lowest number that you could you could get printed on Blu-ray, basically. <laughs> so they had they had like 850 copies that they weren't allowed to sell, but that they had. So they finally kind of like pulled some teeth over at Morgan Creek. It's like, look, come on, let's sell the rest of these. People are like begging for it. So Morgan Creek allowed them to sell the rest. So there are like a thousand of these copies that have been sold. And they sold out like fast. Um, and that was a whole nother like point of consternation between like the whole Occupy Midian um, fan base was just, oh, the people who didn't get them were beside themselves. And still to this day, when one goes on eBay, it's like, it's like freaking crucifixion for that poor soul who tries to sell their copy on eBay <laughs> and, and like jack up the price, right? Oh man, it's funny. But anyway, so I, I decided, all right, I'm going to watch this movie with Jeff. He's seeing it for the first time. Which version am I going to show him? So I decided to watch the theatrical cut, the director's cut, and the cabal cut for the first time, the cabal cut for the first time, all in a couple days ago. And that was going to decide, based on that, which version I was going to show Jeff. And, and far and away, it wasn't even a difficult decision. I thought it would be, but it's not. It's the director's cut. It is clearly the definitive version of this, of this movie. The cabal, gut, cabal cut has its charms. It's definitely... Um, essential for the super fan like me, but no fucking way is it the best version of this movie. We can talk about why later, but um, but I, I decided, yes, definitely the director's cut. And then I started thinking about that some more, and if you've read the Nightbreed comic that came out around the same time as the movie was released, I think it was on Dynamite, um, was the publisher. Oh, at the time when the yeah. DVD came out? When Whenever they released the, the original comic. Oh, that was Marvel. Oh, what, what, I think it says Dynamite on it. Was that a division of Marvel? No, uh, that might have been later. Either Boom or Dynamite got the rights to, to release them, and they may have released Cause Boom, classic versions yeah. of the Boom. Of the Boom definitely did the one that came out a few years ago. But um, no, the, the the series that you always have me go to conventions and look. Yeah, for yeah, issues, that's Marvel. Okay, uh, that that was part of the original. That was all that. Or like right at 90, 91, mm -hmm. that was when when Clive had his imprint. Of yeah. Well, um, well, I read I read that you know I have most of those issues and um, and if you read the the first you know three or four issues, it's it's the movie, and then it kind of oh, goes that's a classic Marvel. And then thing too. and then it kind of goes along and continues the story, which is pretty pretty fun to read. Um, but those but if you read it, it's the director's cut. Like the ending in the comic is the ending that's in the director's cut. It's not. It's none of the bullshit yeah, from the Clyde theatrical. Barker's right. Plan. So it's almost like it's the storyboards. They're there. They were there all along. You know, which is kind of neat to see that vision now finally on on the screen. So, so that was kind of my plan. I was like, all right, I got I got to show Jeff the director's cut, and then I felt like yeah, I have to as a because it's the ending that I grew up with. Show him the theatrical ending, and. That's kind of a funny thing, too, because at first I sort of mourned the theatrical ending, the whole thing with, um, we're not even really, they have no reference really for this, but, but there's a resurrection of, of, of the main villain of the movie, mm -hmm. and I kind of, that always kind of shook me as a kid when I watched that, um, but in hindsight it makes no fucking sense. No, I didn't get it. Yeah. I, I did not get it. Um, so I think what, what we should do... I've got a lot of that, like, the the different cuts out of the way. I think we should talk about the movie itself. Yeah. Let's frame it within within the context of, of the other Barkers we've watched, mm -hmm. the themes yeah. that are presented, and, and maybe it's best, Jeff, for you to kind of take us through the movie, <laughs> and, and I can kind of come in with yeah, the anecdotal you might, you might information. To, you might have to help me a little bit yeah. in some pieces, because, so... I can I can pretty much tell you what happens in the second and third act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first act is where I have my biggest yeah. confusion. And so um so let me give you the high level yep. plot of this story. Um you have Aaron Boone mm -hmm. 
manager, manager of, the of, the Yankees. Yan- of the Yankees. Yeah. So that guy right now is a fucking monster. <laughs> I know your secret, Aaron. You, you know, you know that um, Aaron Judge is night breed. Oh, Giancarlo, that, Giancarlo Stanton, and Aaron Judge—they're night breed. <laughs> just look at them. <laughs> just look at them. Um, so anyway, <laughs> um, so <laughs> derail. Yeah, derail. Uh, Aaron Boone has dreams. He has nightmares. Yeah. Uh, the, the movie opens up basically after you see all this crazy monster stuff happening. Yeah. He wakes up and, um, you know, he's like, you know, shaken, obviously. And so um, Lori, his girlfriend, mm-hmm. uh, is kind of talking to him about, it's like, hey, um, you know, let's let's go on vacation. You know, it's like, let's let's leave this shit. Let's behind. get out of town. Let's yep. get out of town. Um, and he's he's kind of eh, wishy washy about it. Uh, he gets a message from uh, a Doctor Decker. Yeah, he mentions that he mentions that to Lori that Decker's been calling him, and he hasn't returned his calls. Um, to which Lori sort of gets a little concerned because now we're you know we get the sense all right Decker is a psychiatrist, played by David Cronenberg. Yeah, That's David Cronenberg. Um, and um, yeah, I mean he's he's a creepy dude. That's yes. an interesting point too, because when I saw this movie for the first time, I didn't know fucking clue who David Cronenberg was, and then when I started watching David Cronenberg movies and knew what David Cronenberg looked like, this movie sort of had a whole new life for me. Yeah, you know, in that sense too. Yeah, and so but um, he is Aaron Boone's psychiatrist. His name, right. his name is uh, Decker, and so. Uh, we do see intercut at some point here in this very uh, in the first opening fifteen minutes or so. A family has gotten slaughtered yep. by this this guy with a really creepy mask with button eyes and a zipper mouth yeah. that's kind of crooked. Yeah, and, and it's uh, it's a pretty iconic look. Um, it is actually. We've seen that mask. Oh, at, most at, definitely at uh, horror or, at horror hound. Oh, for sure. And uh, so it's a cool. I mean, it's a, it's a it's, it's a cool probably look. in some ways it's the most iconic image of this movie yes yeah and he you know the guy is always carrying big knives and and that's the image that i've seen on on a cover of a comic book yeah. of him with a big giant yeah there knife. is there's one of the comic yep. covers of that yep and so um and, and so now this is where i'm a little bit confused because so decker tells aaron uh-huh. aaron aaron boone boone we'll call him boone boone he's referred to mostly as boone boone yep uh, he tells Boone, "Hey, um, you know the, the there's been these murders, and the cop has asked, you know, the cops have asked me if there's anybody that I know of who could perpetrate these crimes." Right. And he basically makes it seem like that he has given Boone up. Yeah. Which, by the way, dick move, psychiatrist. I don't right. know how you do shit in Canada. Right. But doctor patient confidentiality. I th- I, well, you made a comment later that the doctors at the hospital are like, I'm like, don't take me to a Canadian. Oh, they all suck. Don't take me to a Canadian hospital. USA. US, <laughs> I will gladly pay my it's, insurance. It's that <laughs> damn universal health care. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All the doctors suck in, in yeah, Calgary. They all suck. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so, okay, so this is where I'm a little bit confused because okay. at what point is it revealed that Boone has a connection to this underworld okay, so, group of monsters? So he talks about that when he goes to see him. So basically, okay. Boone, Lori knows that Boone has had these issues with bad dreams and, and some sort of psychosis, and that Decker has sort of helped him th- talk through these issues. And, and he's in a really good place now, and he's in a stable relationship and has a stable job. Um, seems like he's, he's really gotten a lot better. And um, he also uh, did he, you just say that he had like hallucinations and stuff? And hallucinations, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, okay. um, so you know, he has this bad dream. He talks to Lori about it. He mentions Decker, and she says she, that he should probably go talk to him. You know, he call him back, find out what he wants. Um, and then De- um, Boone makes the comment, it's "Like I don't even the bad dreams aren't even that bad anymore. I've kind of started to like them, right?" Mm-hmm. Um, which really kind of, I think, grounds him again. It gives you a sense that, okay, either, you know, there, it could go either way, right? Either he's, he's become s- stable enough to, to realize that they're just dreams and they're not that big a deal and, and you, they can be playful, or also that he's embraced the darkness in some right. way, right? Um, but he does. He calls, 
it, Decker calls back again because he's been calling all week. He answers the phone. He agrees to meet him. So then he goes to Decker's office and he has a conversation with him. And that's when Decker makes the uh, tells him it's like, you know, you you created this fantasy world of Midian and monsters and everything, and um, and and it basically Boone's like, yeah, it was all. I just made it all up. I needed some place. You know, in my mind, where where I would be forgiven for my sins, where I where where everything was okay, and I didn't feel any pain, right? Um, but in reality, Boone had been hearing about Midian either through his dreams, which turned out to be prophetic, but or from other people. He he even mentioned that when he talks to Decker, he's like, "It's just people talk about it. it's none of it's true." But you get the sense that it, weirdly, of all places in Calgary, Canada, <laughs> that that people know. They talk about this place called Midian like it's uh, an urban legend, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, and so so Decker then says, okay, well, I've got something for you, and produces a medicine bottle. With oh, the- oh, first, first, first. Um, he, he essentially tells him that, yeah, the police have come to him. Right. And, yeah, and that there there's these killings that are happening. And he shows him photographs of the yeah, killings. Yeah, like of the crime scenes. And, and he tells him, these these are the exact same things you were describing to me in your dreams, right? And um, and, and he's like, do you want me to play you the 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 video or the um, audio, the audio recording. recording? He's like, no, no, no. You know, so, he's, so Boone is starting to believe that maybe this he was the perpetrator of these terrible murders, and he just can't remember them. They weren't dreams. They were him in some sort of fugue, fugue state. state. Right. Yeah. And uh, so that's when Decker says, okay, well, I've got something here that will help you. With right. Produces this bottle of pills, which I think actually causes hallucination. Right. And makes him basically scared yeah. of the real world. Yeah. Decker is playing games. Right. And so uh, Boone ends up going uh, out to where he believes Midian is, which is a graveyard. And um, the cops show up. Now, this is one of my favorite moments in this whole <laughs> fucking movie. So the cops show up. Oh, you were skipping too much here. Well, God damn it. <laughs> Sorry. You're skipping too much because um, because he goes to the hospital first. Oh, yeah. I've, okay, yeah. And he meets, somebody, he meets yeah. somebody in the hospital who is, who's raving on and on about a place called Midian. Right, and, and, and Boone's like, wait, did you just say Midian? And the guy at first was like, I'm not going to tell the likes of you, you scuzzbag. Right. And, right. And, you're, not, you're not accepted. And I don't know this actor's name, but uh, he plays this character in the movie called Narcisse, and he is fantastic. Like, he, does, he goes from different sort of tones very quickly and seamlessly in this scene. And um, there, it's a really playful scene between him and Boone where he – doesn't trust Boone, but then he's convinced that Boone can lead him to Midian. And actually ends up becoming, almost seems like he believes that Boone is some sort of savior. Right, some sort that, of that, God. that Boone is going to lead him to Midian. Right. right. And, he, and he thinks that he's being tested. And this, I feel, is the first truly Barker moment in this movie. Yeah. Like because it is, he's like, oh, well, you're testing me, so let me show you who I really am. Right. And starts slicing his, his skin off of his with these skull. With these thumb hooks. Yeah. yeah. Of course they're hooks. Yeah. Of course, of course, they're, course they're hooks. Of course. I'm surprised he didn't rip his nipples off, too. <laughs> well, no, that guy comes later. <laughs> yeah, it does. That guy, gets, that guy gets his nipples ripped later. Um, so, um, and he holds his, he holds his scalp out yeah, to Boone like, as, hey, as like an offering. It's, yeah. Oh, it's awesome. It is a cool shot. So now Boone is like, okay, well he learned from this guy that, oh, you know, you go over the river and through the woods. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to, to, <laughs> to freaking Right. Yeah. Uh, so, Hellscape. Right. And so, uh, Boone goes out to this graveyard. Can we can we talk about the the ripping of the scalp first though? Which, because, by all means. Because um, think about the scene uh, towards the end of Lord of the Illusions, mm-hmm. where they're doing the same thing. Well, they're cutting their they're, they're hair cutting off. They're cutting their hair off. They're, they're scalping themselves. This is this is a this is a Barker thing. This is a this is a way of like degrading yourself, or 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 tearing off your flesh as offering or sacrifice for something. Yeah, some weird shit. It is. It is. But it, it it's 
I feel like that's you know it, you're gonna check off play play Barker Bingo. Yeah, and and that's bingo. a square. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> hooks through nipples, weird sex shit. <laughs> Scalping yourself. You're scalping bingo. yourself, bingo. Um, okay. So. so okay. So now uh, Boone is out at the cemetery, and the cops show up, and out comes uh, a, a black gentleman. Yes. And uh, I'm like, boy, I know that guy from someplace. But we'll get to that in a minute. This is amazing. Oh yes. gosh. Yeah. When I found this, I, I do we know? Our, do we know his act, the actor's name? Okay. Uh, I don't. Uh, well, I saw it. It's um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, anyway. So, um, out comes David Cronenberg, Decker. Yeah. And he's like, wait, everybody, you're wasting your time trying to, trying to get him to give himself up. I know how to talk to him. Yeah. Which is kind of weird because Cronenberg even does some flip-flopping here, too, because he's like, you're not, you're wasting your time. But wait, let me talk to him. Yeah. Yeah. And so he goes up to uh, Boone and it's like, hey, come on, man, what's going on here? Why are you here? What's going on? And I think at that point Boone admits that he's that. Well, Boone Boone at this point has gone to Midian and he's encountered um, two of the monsters that live at Midian. He's encountered yeah. um, this guy with a uh, like a moon face. It's, yeah, that's what he, his he looks like name. he looks like the McDonald's Mac tonight. Guy. Yes, yeah. yes, that's exactly <laughs> right. And he, and this other guy with these sort of like tentacle um, dreadlocks. Dreadlocks, uh, and that and that his name is Peliquin. And um, there's a standoff scene where Moonface has Boone by by a knife, and Peliquin. Um, and he's basically he's got him by a knife, basically just saying, "You got to get out of here." Right. And, yeah. and Pelic- Peliquin wants to eat him. He says he's he's um, flesh. He's a natural. He's flesh for the beast. Um, and this is a moment where where Boone is like, "No, I'm, I've killed people." And Peliquin's like, no, 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 no. no you, I can smell, I can the smell innocence, innocence fifty yards away. Yeah, you you haven't killed anyone, and and basically tells him whoever told him that he's a killer is a liar. He's a liar. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. and uh, and Peliquin bites him. Yeah, he bites. Which him. Starts to like throb. Yeah, and it's like really yeah. kind of gross. Um, so uh, Boone comes out of the the cemetery and the cops show up, and uh, Decker comes up to him, and it's like, oh, come on, man, what are you doing here? It's just give yourself up and. And Boone's like, but I haven't killed anybody. You're lying to me, basically. To which the, the response that Decker has is great. He's like, he's got a gun. <laughs> and so the cops blow Boone's ass away. Yeah. Our hero is now dead. Boy, they weren't messing around. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the, the uh, coroner's says. assistant says. Uh, so Boone gets taken to... Oh, they weren't taking any chances with this guy. Yeah, they weren't taking any chances with this guy. <laughs> So Boone gets taken to the morgue. Yeah. And they call Lori. Mm-hmm. And Lori, uh, they ask Lori, it's like, so how do you know Boone? Uh, Decker's kind of, you know, uh, pressing her for some info. Yeah. And Lori's like, he couldn't have killed anyone. And, he couldn't have killed anyone. And Decker anyone. says the line, everyone has a secret face, right? Right. So it's, it's a really cool line because it's sort and, of um, and it's also, foreshadowing. It's foreshadowing yeah. about Decker, too. Yep. Um, so um, she doesn't really believe that he's been killed. Uh, but then there's a commotion in the morgue because Decker, or not Decker, sorry, Boone, yep. Boone has come back to life uh, and he escapes. He escapes. Uh, it's kind of a janky cut scene yeah, where it is. you hear, you see him kind of wake up and then next, it, like smash cut to a broken window. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's, it's a little jarring. And then but, there's sort of a weird director's cut scene where Laurie sees a vision of Boone at the window which yeah. I'm not really sure I dig on that too much. No, that that almost is like it's telegraphing to us what, yeah, what happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it's weird. But it does sort of remind me a little bit of... Um, of uh, Candyman. Candyman, right, where... where um, what's her name? The... Virginia Madsen's Virginia cat character, where she's in the insane Helen. asylum, Helen, and she's um, talking to her doctor. Yeah, and the and Candyman shows up, kills her doctor, and, and then, then she flies out and the then she jumps out the window. It's kind of similar yeah. to that. Yeah. So, um, so now, Bo- uh, so Boone is in the wind now, and Lori decides she's going to go try to find out what's going on because yeah. the the coroner believes that somebody has stolen the body. Yeah. Which um, is what I, you would guess. Uh, right. But yeah. I think Decker realizes it's something else. And now he's kind of got this uh, this detective guy with him. And he also goes back to his tapes. 
Decker right. does, and he enlists some of the stories that Boone told about Midian, and that uh, Midian is a place where you can't die, and all this. Right. So, he and gets, so he realizes that he's a immortal yeah. creature of and, some and sort. that really rankles Decker for some reason. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he throws that tape recorder across so, the room. All right, so let me ask you something. I don't... You see, that scene is, I think, problematic because you see all these knives laid out on the table. Yeah, it's like, ding, 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 Decker's the master. Right, killer. right. I right. think that it really it really gives the whole game away. Um, I would have rather he listened to that in his office as opposed to his villain's lair yeah. with this weird waterfall and thing I thought about I thought it. about, you know, should we give that twist away as we talk about it? But I really don't feel like it's that big of a twist. It you're, really you're, isn't. You're going to figure it out pretty it, quickly. It, I tell you right now, guys, if you went to Wikipedia, you probably already know. Yeah. Yeah. So, also, it's fucking David Cronenberg. Right. Of course. Right. I mean, he's not going to be the good guy in a movie. I really, you know, it's a funny thing. <laughs> we'll get to this, but in the, the theatrical cut, uh, Cronenberg is resurrected. Um, oh, yeah. In the director's cut, he's not. He's dead. He's dead. Yeah. And and, so, and somebody did an interview with Cronenberg, um, and they mentioned Nightbreed and talked about the fact that the director's cut was now a thing and that the ending was different. And uh, Cronenberg kind of sarcastically uh, said, oh, well, shoot, I guess I won't be in the sequel then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty good, good. yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, so, uh, so now, um, you know, Boone has gone back to Midian, and – learns more about the culture and all of the and there's a pretty deep culture I, we can't really get into no, it fully we can't but it's you know they they worship uh baphomet which is you know had led them to midian because um as we see later the uh, Lori has shown the past where they were hunted down as creatures yes. as beasts uh, lots of guys in a lot of religious garb yeah uh killing these people killing these people and just various torturous right. there, ways there is a Ku, a Ku Klux Klan guy kind yeah. of but in black yeah as you would see oftentimes in in old Catholic texts yeah and stuff like that so uh anyway uh he learns more and basically um he's now immersed in this and and Lori has kind of gone out to find out what happened and so she basically wants to find Midian yep um to which point, I believe at that point, kind of Decker follows. Yes. And, and is kind of hot on her trail, thinking she's going to lead me to right. the place that I want to be. Now, the reason why he wants to be there is because he sees himself as the ultimate Grim Reaper yeah. to this this to the society he doesn't he he is, likes to be yes the bringer of death right um he, well he calls himself death. Uh, yes he calls himself yeah. death and he he especially targets families because because they breed and they create right. life and then he wants an end to that right, right. and so the fact that there are these so beings who cannot be killed or or are, are difficult to kill or who um, have come back to life and have gone beyond death, to him, that is the ultimate offense. Yeah, right. And uh, so, as it turns out, the psychiatrist, spoilers, is kooky insane. Yeah. As they typically are in these types of movies. Yeah, he's, he's our button-faced uh, killer. Right. And um, he uses Lori to get to Boone, who, who did not have his body stolen, who resurrected, and who um, fled back to Midian. Right. So, really, at this point, once uh, Boone, you know, so Boone shows up in this town near where Midian is, and uh, well, long story short, Boone gets arrested. Yeah, gets so set up and arrested. So basically, here's here's another conundrum with this movie, um, and a, and a, and Boone, um, he he had essentially Decker set a trap. For Boone, right. he 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 threatens Lori. Um, he's going to kill Lori unless Boone intercedes. Um, Lylesburg, who's played by the great Doug Bradley of Pinhead fame, um, warns him that he cannot go above ground. He puts all of the Nightbreed at, at risk. If he does, Boone defies him, goes up, saves Lori, uh, but Decker gets away, and Decker realizes at this point what he's really dealing with. Right. Um, so then he basically sets the trap. He knows where the Nightbreed are. Right. And also sets the trap to get Boone out of the picture. Yeah. By having a, a massacre 
happen at the hotel that Lori is staying at. Yeah. And, and, and basically and catches Boone. And Boone, Boone has in. kind of been banished at this right. point, too. He's like, oh, you made your choice. You made your, that you made the choice of the naturals, so you will go on your way. Right. Right. And so uh, Boone gets arrested, thrown in jail, and then we meet our our police oh, he's, sheriff. He's so amazing. Uh, who, Captain Igerman. Ki- Captain Igerman, oh. who is the most over-the-top, you know who he reminds me of yokel yeah. that you've ever seen. He kind of reminds me if you took, um, well, definitely if you took the 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 dude from Avatar, like the oh yeah yeah that That's guy, exactly what like I thought, the main dude. villain from Avatar, yeah, and mixed him in with a little bit of like just just redneck, a Jackie know? Gleason a, from uh, yeah uh, from, from Smoking a, the Bandit. Yes, it's yeah. perfect. Um, and because he's got a he gets oh so. Again, long story short, you've got these yokels who now, who think that this guy is just some mass murdering cannibal. How they f- figure he's a cannibal, my guess is that's just what they were pissed off about. Yeah. You know. He had some blood in his mouth. Um, but yeah, it's kind of just yeah, a. It's, it's, it's kind of ju- like, it's, it's like saying, I'm pissed at liberals this week because uh, they don't want me. To to call African American people black, but it was it was it was funny because Jeff, you even you, you said it. it was like the way the way Igerman says you fucking cannibal, almost like almost like it's the third one that yeah, week that like, they that they put in jail. Are, <laughs> yeah, we are getting overrun by these goddamn cannibals. <laughs> so um, the, the a doctor comes in, which is weird. This is a weird part because they they bring in a doctor, yeah, to quote unquote prove that they've not beaten him up. Although they beat oh, the, they, shit, they beat out the shit out of him, yeah. And the doctor says, "I can't get a pulse," which flips out this deputy. Like the, he the, is like he pulls a gun. The Italian Yakon Phoenix, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's like, "Whoa, what?" He's like, "It's like uh, he yeah. points his gun at him as he, as he backs out of the cell." Right. And so he tells uh, Igerman that you know they don't have pulse. Holy shit! And so this guy's like, "All right." Let's just go torch this fucking place down because, like, uh, because Decker's like, I know where these guys are at. I know where you can find them. They're freaks. They're monsters. Let's go get them. Uh, he sends some people out, and well, uh, he well, um, it's our um, uh, the African American cop, right? The black cop in this movie is played by the same guy who's Captain Panaka in Star Wars Episode One of The Phantom Menace. That's freaking amazing. Who was probably actually one of the best characters in that movie yeah and here he is he was relegated to a background character in that movie but here actually kind of plays an important part yeah he's sort of the voice of reason right because they uh he gets sent out with a few of the yokels to go check out the cemetery yeah and he uh they they find this one very kindly night breed who has this little bulldog yeah a little french bulldog. bulldog yeah who um, gets drug out into the sun, and the sun affects some of the night breed. And this guy, like, is brutally killed by yeah. the sunlight. I he, mean, like, he turns to to dust and explodes. Right, yeah. and he tries to reach out for the help of Captain Panaka. Yeah, which I'm just gonna call him that. Yeah, but just do it. He's the Royal Naboo Captain Panaka. Yeah, and uh, Panaka at first is like kind of weirded out by him and backs up, but then realizes. There's something more to what's going on here, and this is bad. And he and recognizes that the sun was the weapon, and, right? Yeah, and that these people are not natural mm-hmm. beings, and so he's he seems almost sympathetic. Yeah, that oh my god, we just murdered this person who didn't do anything, right? And um, but it, but yeah, but then the, their squad car gets torched, gets and torched. you realize that Narcisse, um, a character named Rachel. Um, and Lori. And Lori all are headed back to town to rescue Boone, which right. they do. And in the meantime, the... The, the yokels have united. Yeah, Igerman has, has basically formed a, a, a posse. A militia. A militia, which he's, already, which he's already got a militia. It's called the Sons of the Free. He's, he's the sheriff of this little town, and he's also <laughs> like the militia leader. Oh, my God. It's, and they have this huge arsenal of just all sorts of illegal weapons. And, and like this guy in, in, the, uh, in the armory is like getting off on the Yeah, he's like weapons. licking his garrote. I mean, yeah. it's really weird and awesome. But it, it's all played for, for comedic value because the humans in this – are cartoonish. Yeah, um, it, they're, they're, it, the humans up. are mindless villains. They're right. they're what the the monsters are usually portrayed as. Right, 
And so they go, and for the basically the last 40 minutes of this movie, yeah. is fucking war between the monsters and the humans. Yep. All of Midian gets fucking blown up. Now, some people, some of the Nightbreed escape. Some stay behind to, um, well, I mean, they get kind of caught. I mean, they're, yeah. they're not really staying behind on purpose, but they don't know how to fight. They've never had the fight. They've been in hiding, hiding for most of their who existence. Know, for, who knows how long, yeah. Right, and so... Um, <laughs> so, you know, so so Boone is trying to lead them in battle and, and empower them and give them weapons. But they're and, all, they, and they don't know to what fight. to do. So some are just getting slaughtered. Others are, are fighting. Um, and he comes up with the great idea of, well, we've got this thing, and we've got these monsters that are uncontrollable, in the uh, yeah. bowels called of the berserkers Midian. the yeah. berserkers well, let's just let them out yeah see what they can do against these th- and they tear the shit out of the place yeah and my connection here too to this and i don't know that it's a direct connection but i always kind of well i shouldn't say that because i hadn't seen rawhead rex in a long long time but after seeing rawhead rex and talking about with this jet with jeff i was like holy shit that's a berserker i really do believe that there's some sort of connection there the, yeah, in, in, in the Barker verse, if you will, I, that, I think re, I think you can very easily retcon one to fit the other. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so basically, the whole place gets destroyed. Boone is now looked at as kind of this both savior and apocalyptic character. Yeah, um, as I mentioned, uh, this fits most religions that that exist to this day. That they're all basically self cannibalizing mm-hmm. myths. Uh, there's a beginning and there's an end to all of these. And Boone represents the end. Um, you know, the Christian faith takes uh, Ragnarok mm-hmm. as their uh, revelations, basically, uh, because the Christian faith just kind of borrowed from whatever they could to sure. get people to convert. Yep. And so they borrowed Ragnarok and turned it into revelations. And um, it's that same idea. It's, you know, the, whatever text you read or whatever faith you follow there is a beginning and there's an end and it's it's apocalyptic Mm -hmm. um there is a a definite beginning and a definite end and that's what's kind of seen here uh but much like the ragnarok kind of idea there's a rebirth too yes the idea is that exactly right not only is boone kind of bringing about the destruction of Midian and everything that they live for, but he's leading them to something better right. new. And he's literally re- reborn in this movie. Um, mm-hmm. He is he has been reborn as Nightbreed because of Pelican's bite, which is revealed as as a prophecy of a cave painting that Pelican shows Lori. And he um, didn't want to believe it, but he did it anyway. But he did it anyway. and yeah. um, But it just kind of shows that you're kind of trapped in your fate. Right, exactly. Yeah. And... Um, and then uh, not only is he reborn, but he's renamed. Baphomet renames uh, Boone Cabal. It's like, you are no longer Boone. You are Cabal. You are now the, the, my protector. Uh, my um, Rebuild what you destroyed. Rebuild what you destroyed. Um, protect me from my enemies. Right? Find me and protect me. Find me and protect me from so my he enemies. So he doesn't just walking around with a big giant statue of Baphomet. He has to now seek out Baphomet and lead the Nightbreed to... Right, and, and, and the night in the nightbreed, whereas... the nightbreed. There's there's a sense that yes, uh, some of them are in a barn at the end, together. But there's more of a sense that they have they have spread. They have there's been a diaspora, mm-hmm. right? And they're mm-hmm. they're now um, spread all out because they've all just panicked and ran. And that Boone has got to find everyone, and, put, lead and an bring exodus. them together. Yeah, and lead an, an exodus. Yeah. Ab- absolutely. So, um, yeah, so, you know, Lori in the end uh, stabs herself with, a, with one of uh, the, uh, David Cronenberg's knives yes. to kill herself so that she can become a nightbreed, a, a nightbreed because as well. Because she she's, wants to be with Boone, and she understands that Boone is, for all intents and purposes, immortal. Um, and, and really kind of dead to the real world. Yeah. yeah I mean, or to the normal world. And she would rather be with him than live without him. So and she, and so only, she stabs herself. So she stabs herself. To which I think, oh, my God, that's a terrible She's like, decision. that hurt way more than I thought it would. <laughs> <laughs> this was a terrible idea. Uh, but if she died... She was okay with that, you know. So yep. it's, you know, it's and kind Boone, of a sweet little ending. Yeah. So Boone bites her, and she be- she comes that, back. Hopes that it's going to. And to she does, and she's and she becomes Nightbreed, and 
and um, this is this a, a totally different ending. Oh my God! Yeah. So this was uh, not uh, in the theatrical cut at all. So, so that's the movie as a whole. The idea is is that now Boone and Lori are going to go out and try to find Baphomet, and then come back, gather all the Nightbreed, and lead them to. It's also seen on a cave painting. Yes. Um, so Which, that is the yes. end of the director's cut, essentially. Right. But the ending of the theatrical cut doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. At all. So, so the ending of the theatrical cut has none of that with Laurie. Um, Narcisse, the mm-hmm. the guy who who tears his scalp off and becomes Nightbreed, he um, he actually survives. He dies in the director's cut. Yeah, in the director's cut, he's actually decapitated by Cronenberg. By, yeah, by 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 Cronenberg Decker. Um, but in the the theatrical cut, he survives and. You get really kind of a sense that maybe they're all together at the end, but then for some reason Boone has to go off on his own. It's kind of weird. It's it's very it's very confusing, cut. and there's no there's no real resolution with Lori at all. And yeah, she's just there. And then Father Ashbury. So Father Ashbury <laughs> is a drunk in uh, what's the name of the town? Sheerneck. Sheerneck. Uh, Father Ashbury is just kind of the local drunk. And he's, he's a priest. In, right, and he's a priest, but he's been thrown in jail next door to Boone. Boone. Um, when the yokels rise up, yeah, <laughs> um, they they in, they recruit Ashbury. Yeah, Igerman specifically says we're going to have God on our side. Yeah, so and Ashbury, brings Ashbury are you sober. Come on, yeah, let's go. And you're just going to read Bible passages, which do mention Midian. Midian, right? Yeah. So the. Um, <laughs> So what's interesting is I, um, Ashbury gets to Midian and he sees the the fight that's happening around him and he realizes that there's children there and he doesn't he kind of doesn't get comfortable with what's gonna about to happen and he he has an encounter with Boone and he wants to join um, the Nightbreed. Uh, he feels like this is probably you know something that he's been searching for. He even renounces his his priest collar to right. join. So this is another rawhead Rex. Yeah. Um, what was the other one that uh, the other um, wasn't there another like a renouncing of yeah. your faith well I mean that's kind of a Barker theme in general yeah. but I mean certainly Rawhead Rex we saw it with, oh most definitely yeah. Um, but uh, yeah so basically he's like show me what you've seen because yeah. I need to see, I need this now mm-hmm. And so Boone takes him to Baphomet. Well, he kind well, of he, he kind of follows him right. too. Yeah, follows. I mean Boone is not saying no, get the fuck out of here. Right. He just like whatever, dude. You can follow if you want. Is the kind of look he gives. Yeah. So, it's kind of the look that that uh, <laughs> that Boone has most of the movies. Like whatever, dude. Whatever, you want dude. To follow. Go ahead. At <laughs> your own peril. Um, so you know Ashbury kind of gets down there and like a dumbass reaches for a what he thinks is holy water i'm assuming yeah because it's, it's kind of this bowl of bubbling acidic looking water yeah and he's like oh what's this and he pulls it and he fucking splashes it all over his face and gets burned and at the end of the movie he's like they burned me so i want to burn that it's like you motherfucker, you asshole <laughs> you fucking burned yourself i'm angry about him now. yeah Fuck oh, that guy. oh he's a dick He's a dick. He's total. But dick. yeah, the end of the theatrical cut, he uses that same liquid and puts it inside of the dead Decker and, and brings, resurrects brings him. Back. Basically, makes Decker makes Nightbreed. Decker his god. Right. Yeah. And, and essentially, making him Nightbreed because right. it was the same thing that was used to heal. Right. To uh, it was Baphomet's approval mm-hmm. of Boone. Yes. It, to heal his bowl. If wounds. you were to become the tri- part of the tribes of the moon, you would survive that right. that burn. Yeah. So um, fuck that priest guy, man. But in but in the burn me, so I'm gonna burn them, all of them. <laughs> me, but me, in me, the me. in the director's cut, however, there a uh, Decker stays dead, but Ashbury still Father Ashbury still um, delivers those lines in a different way, but instead to Igerman, and he kills Igerman, and he sets himself up as the the bad guy the if, if there were to be a sequel. Yeah, yeah. Um, that guy was a fucking whiny little ass. Yes, he Fuck was. That guy. Yes. Show me. Now I'm gonna burn myself. And I'm gonna blame you. <laughs> fucking. That's some fucking uh, <laughs> hypocrisy, man. But hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. I'm gonna call him hypocrisy, man. Yeah, it, it's not really. Um, 
Hmm. It, it just it's more that cartoonish idea of, yeah. of, the, of the villains. And, and it's definitely an idea of let's I see where the studio was coming from with that with wanting Decker because Decker's the slasher killer. He's well, he's, he's cool. The, looking. He's cool looking. And I mean, hey, if we, hey, if this thing is going to be a hit, we want we more can, of that guy. We can sell, those we can masks. sell that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this this burned priest eh, cannot really carry a He's got a sequel. weird head. Yeah. And it's Cronenberg, right? Yeah, Cronenberg, So, so you can kind of get a sense of why they want that. But um, the way it's cut, the way the whole ending is cut, it just it's just bad in the theatrical. Yeah, it is. Because it's very confusing. I mean, it, it, it cuts out a solid, like, feels like 10 minutes mm-hmm. of, of stuff. Just to Easily. boom, 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 boom. Just Easily. get to the end. Um, there's no real. I mean, you feel like in the in the in the director's cut, there is actually a an ending, like a the the whole story is told. Yeah. And now the sequel is priest bad guy, uh, cabal looking for right. Baphomet. Yeah. And you get and, the, and, and, a new minion. and you get the sense that yeah that the priest will be hunting the Nightbreed and uh, Ashbury will be hunting the Nightbreed and Boone will be trying to to find them before they're hunted. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, let me talk about one thing that I yeah. really, really like about the Cabal cut. Okay. And it's the, uh, is it Captain Panaka <coughs> with a P? Panaka, yeah. Panaka. Panaka. So Tanaka his... is uh, the Japanese contact in You Only Live Twice. Yes, Tanaka. Tiger Tanaka. Tiger Tanaka was his name. <laughs> even, in the, even in the Inflaming books. I know my James Bond. <laughs> um, his arc, his arc in the Cabal <coughs> cut is much more interesting and much more realized. He, um, you see him very early on after the uh, killing of the family by the button-faced Cronenberg. Yes. Um, he has a scene uh, where he talks about the fact that he feels like he's failing these kids because there's been several of these killings. Um, you also, in the uh, theatrical, sorry, in the um, director's cut and the theatrical, he gets killed right before the big battle um, with the Nightbreed and the humans by Decker. Um, and then his whole thing is done. It's almost like, well, got to cut that storyline out because we're, we're short on time. Can't sell a horror movie that's over two hours. And, and I think <laughs> still probably if, it, if it, I don't know this for certain, um, but I feel like Barker didn't want him to go out that way, but they didn't quite have the elements that they needed to complete his arc in the director's cut. You kind of got the impression that by the time he gets to, and he figures out what's going on at Midian, he's starting to realize that Decker is insane. Yeah. You kind of get, there's subtext there. Yeah. This is not a very rich in subtext movie. What's really... Which is unlike the other Barker movies that we covered this month. That's very true. It's not. Um, it's all very overt. It's all pretty and, much there on the surface. Right. And it seems like there was subtext to Panaka and he... and, and But they... they, they what there it. is with Panaka, if they, if they were able to tell his whole story, in which they tell in the Cabal cut, albeit through a lot of really poor VHS footage... Is he's a he's kind of um, the redemption story. He's he discovers what's going on. He he isn't really super comfortable with all of the killing of the Nightbreed. He sees all these crazy lunatics with Igerman as they're slaughtering these monsters, and he actually has a has a moment where he starts to help them. He's carrying children, saving children. He survives. It's, it's that whole idea of I couldn't save the children that were being right. Killed. Exactly. Now I can save it's, these. it's it's really kind of beautiful. Yeah, it's not. And and my assumption is is it's not meant to set him up as a hero, but just as a this is my chance for to to, to solve the problems I was having. Right. To, to have to come to right. some peace right. with this whole thing. Yes, it's exactly right. And and um, it could be a situation where even you could have played it as if you kept that. You could have still had him at the end, basically saying, "I'm letting you go this time." Right, right, right. I don't want to come and I, right. I don't want anything to do with you, or I will have to do something against you. Yeah. So yeah. it's that's so that, I just made up my own. That, little I like it. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's it. You should maybe you should write the the comic. Um, Give me a job, Clyde Barker. I want to but write speaking comics. of the comic, um, that's an interesting thing too because there are two runs of comics. There was the original run. With, 
that went Marvel concurrent epic, with the movie, the Marvel, yeah, whatever it was, and um, yeah, right, Epic. Epic was the yeah. sun, was the, ep- uh, I think Nightbreed might have been the first. Yeah, Clark it, it was it was Epic because um, it was Marvel with Epic, what used to be their their more mature line. Mm-hmm. Um, that was where like the the um, the Electra run was was that was kind of iconic for her. Yep. Um, uh, Elf Quest, I think, was there, and there um, there were some other kind of fantasy type books that were a lot more mature. Um, then later, after I think that Marvel's like, here's Clyde Barker's whole own line, yeah, and then he did. Oh God, he did a bunch of stuff. A bunch of stuff, meaning four or five titles that had Clive Barker's mm-hmm. whatever. Well, there was there was a, a run, a specific run of Nightbreed that went way beyond the movie. Um, at it that went time. for about what twenty two, twenty four issues. Yeah, that's about like that? right. There were a few crossovers with Hellraiser as well, mm-hmm. and then um, that ended. And um, then when the director's cut came out, and there was a lot of new buzz around Nightbreed, um, Boom Studios. <laughs> Yeah, because Boom resurrected uh, the the Hellraiser book and uh, all sorts. I mean, that's where um, it, it's through Boom. Where if you remember last week's episode, we talked about how uh, the um, uh, the character from Lord of Illusions got tied into the yeah. Hellraiser universe, yep. even became a Harry, Cenobite. Harry Damore. Yeah, even became a Cenobite. Yep. That's all in the Boom Hellraiser series. Yeah. So, so they decided to to you know launch a new um, Nightbreed book, which actually was a prequel. It was really kind of neat. It was um, it told the stories of a lot of the breed characters that were sort of the fan favorites from the movie. Porcupine Lady. Um, yeah, like all of them. Cool. Peliquin. They all kind of had their 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 stories leading up to, and how they kind of came together and and found Midian. It was, um, but it also concurrently told the story of um, Ashbury hunting them as well so yeah. it was kind of like a direct sequel and a prequel it in flashback been, it, it was it neat. would have been kind of cool if we would have seen that various creatures uh, of of lore like the sasquatch or the jersey devil were all in some way shape or form night breed and you know basically in their travels to find midian they were captured you know they were seen by Regular. That would have been kind of cool. I'm, be, I'm writing this fan yeah. fiction, man. Well, well, you know what? I'm going to start a website. There, there is a... <laughs> Nightbreedfanfic.com. I don't know. I don't know how, how Nightbreed fans are, are, man. I don't care. They are... I don't care. I'm going to make them do freaky sex shit. They they are very, very passionate <laughs> I don't care. about this property. Freaky sex shit, man. Clyde Barker will be in the freaky sex yeah, shit. Yeah, he would. I mean, well, well there has been talk. There's been talk about a, um, a TV show. There, there. I forget his name, but there, there is actually someone who's been developed. And I think has tons of scripts written. That it's just a matter of funding and finding the right home for it. Uh, a Nightbreed TV show that would probably do just that. Um, it I would can follow, see that something like that living on AMC or something. Yeah, I think it would. It could be really cool. I think the problem is, it's, it's a tough property to sell, right? Yeah. Um, it was a failed movie. Yeah. I mean, yeah. What, what do you do with a failed the com- property? Even the comic, you know, I mean, there's only so many fans that are going to buy the comic. It didn't really get much of a footing with the Don fan because yeah. it's a lot kind of to jump into. Right. So you really have to start almost at at zero Retelling level. Retelling the story yeah. of, or having prequel type stuff and, that... And, it give, doesn't give, have give enough to to the, to the enthusiasts as as Clive Barker would would prefer the fans are referred to. Oh, um, give enough to them to so that they they enjoy little extra nuggets, but but tell a new story almost. You know what you don't want? What you don't want? You don't want a Highlander series. Oh, where you where you completely and totally some people really liked that. Fuck though. them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm so upset about that, but fuck them. I don't. No. I don't think I ever watched one episode of that. I didn't either. You know why? Why? Because fucking Duncan wasn't in it, it right? Was, or wait, Connor or Duncan? Con- Which one? Duncan was the TV show, right? Yes, Connor, Connor is. Connor McCloud was. Yeah, he was the movie. Uh, Christopher guy. Lambatter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Pretty sure. Right? Connor McCloud. Connor. Yeah. Yeah. Duncan was the fucking. Duncan was the um, dude from, from the TV show who was he was in the fourth movie, right? Yeah, I hated that. Yeah. A fourth movie was better than the second and third movies, though. Eh, debatable. 
Oh, we're gonna, we need to watch this. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It was my own idea. Uh, I texted that to you. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, I mean, what else do you want to get into? Because here's the thing. Way back in episode number one, <laughs> you gave me some shit about... <laughs> About I gave you some my, shit? You gave me some shit about my knowledge of Crisis on Infinite Earths. Yeah. And my uh, near... I Man, I don't want to say I'm an expert, but I academically study the pre-crisis multiple universe yeah. of, of DC. The multiverse. Well, here's the conundrum. I know but where you're going with thing. this. I know here's where you're the going thing. You this. are like into the... I, yeah. I basically told you when yeah. we started, it's like... I'm giving you the driver's seat. Yeah. The fact that you <laughs> let me even give the synopsis, I am kind of shocked. Well, In fact, you could have almost done this episode by yourself. I didn't want to talk the whole time, and I and I wanted your perspective. Because, I know, I know. Because I know. It's a, you've seen the movie for the first time. I, I think that it, it's it's interesting, and I and I feel like that probably the casual listener of this maybe have not has not seen this movie before. Sure. So your perspective, I think, is is important because here's the conundrum I'm in. There are. Um, there are people who love Nightbreed who are going to listen to this and be like, well, you didn't talk about this, 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 and this, right? I'm not going to make those people happy with this podcast because they know everything. They know as much and more than I do that we could talk about this for hours. We could talk about, you know, exact chronological you know, order into different cuts of the cabal cut, and we can go on forever. <laughs> it's kind of like what I told you, where I have 1.6 days worth of Crisis on Infinite Earths podcast right. to listen to. The other side of this <laughs> is is the person who has never seen right uh, Nightbreed or has seen it a couple times and, and liked it. Where I want to give you guys just enough to get kind of like, whoa, that all this shit actually happened, and maybe you can go down your own um, road of discovery well, with me, this film. Let me ask you this. And if you if you don't like this idea, I'll edit it out. <laughs> what would you say about doing something on the website that furthers this discussion that, that kind of gets more into the as a sequel, if you will? Um, what would we talk about in the sequel? Well, I mean, just the, 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 some more of the in depth. Sure. Continue the the academic look at Nightbreed as a as a as an idea I as mean, a project as a what came after what's what i think is interesting about nightbreed um beyond the fact that it's just a fun movie that i love is this um it's pretty freaking rare first of all that you have a situation where a movie gets this second life and this director's cut release so many years by, after so many fact. years after the fact by way of this uncovering of previously lost footage like it, it it's a story in and of itself yeah i mean in, a, in sort of a way i i think of the producer's cut of halloween six yeah where it's a completely different movie all the bits are there mm-hmm. that you've seen before but it's rearranged reshuffled stuff thrown in between you know but anyway i don't know i mean i there's so much that you have and and I, I can't see how long we've already been talking about this, but <laughs> there's so much that you already have with this that I, I, I challenge you to try to present more of it in some way, shape, or form, be it through a solo episode or a half episode sure. or, or some sort of additional material that you could present to people that, that, that goes into further findings of what's kind of surrounding this because i think right now you know we're kind of in a <laughs> this is kind of pulling back the veil a little bit here we're in a little bit of a growth spurt here yeah you know, we're, we've started doing weekly episodes um you know i'm working on the the monster mondays thing that again i can't help i mean i'm going to talk about monster movies and there are going to be people who know things about that that i can't possibly fit into 10 or 15 minutes worth of material yeah yeah and but I, you have to kind of take what we can give you and, sure. and what what we can well, put I think, out there and, I think, and make fun with it. I think that um, what I would love for people to do is discover this movie on their own. Um, you know, watch the different versions. Um, the Cabal Cut is really hard to get a hold of now. I mean, there's only so many copies of this that are going to be produced. It's going to eventually go to gray market. 
Yeah, um, get, it, hit your comic or it, hit your uh, your horror convention. Yeah, it will be the only way to get uh, a hold of this of this cut at, at a certain point. Or of send time. us eighteen dollars for and shipping I, and, and handling. And I don't want to necessarily <laughs> condone that, but no, no. but uh, I know what you're saying. Yeah, it, it's you know it's going to be one of those things where you're going to really have to seek it out, find it, and. But what, what what I really think beyond the movie itself is interesting is the story of of this new version. And I don't know how many people are familiar with a documentary that just recently came out called Dawson City Frozen in Time. But it's a movie about um, all of this silent film footage that was uncovered in, um, in Canada in the, in the old gold rush uh, town, uh, Dawson City, which was like the capital of the Canadian gold rush, this place. And it was a city in, that actually ended up, I think something like 70,000 or 100,000 people lived in this city at one point wow. during the gold rush. That's right? A ton, that's yeah. a huge city. Yeah, it was huge. And it's, you know, obviously as the gold dried out, it, it dwindled and dwindled and, and it became almost a ghost town, but it still exists today. But back in like the 70s, under in the ground, they were digging a foundation for a new building and they started uncovering all of these this film that's like some fucking Blair Witch shit and, and <laughs> yeah and and what they discovered it was this, all these old lost silent films like stuff that had long since been destroyed because it was on the old um, uh, celluloid, celluloid yeah. right so stuff that had burned up burned or broke or yeah faded. and and w- yeah. what they found was that this 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 gold this gold rush town was at the end of the distribution line there were so many people living up there that that there was a distribution film line that went all the way up there and then it just stopped it just it just died mm. there and all these films were stored because the studios were like uh eh. it takes too much to send it back right and they actually told somebody to destroy them but they're like well, i'm not going to do that we're just store them right and then it was forgotten and it got buried and um and then some 50 60 years later it's discovered and it's in pretty good shape and they're going through all these reels and realize this is stuff that doesn't there's no copies of this anymore Hmm. this this was a film that we have record of on paper but nobody has a print of it it's it's they found hundreds of films it's like uh man you, you i bet there were people just just wishing that um what was that? Uh, oh, what? Oh, what's the? Um, I don't know. I'd help you out, but I don't know. It's the old horror movie, uh, the old um, Lon Chaney. Um, that's that's been lost. Um, oh, I don't know. Is it London After Midnight or something like that? It's uh, like one of the most famous films to never be found. Right. Uh, I mean, there's practically nothing remaining of it. Um, so 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 yeah, it's it's like that. It's, yeah. it's like that. It's like it's like. So what we were, were given is this gift. Um, fans of this movie were, are given this gift of this this found footage that has been able to restore Clive's ri- original vision. And you imagine, like almost like the Raiders of the Lost Ark, or you know the looking the, at some of those unmarked VHS tapes would right. be like looking into the Ark of the Covenant. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that too. But you imagine like all right, it was just some storage facility. That yeah said yeah we've got we've got some film labeled Nightbreed. What the fuck else do they have? Yeah. What do they else do they have that's been forgotten to time? And I love the I love that I love the fact that we can just still discover things that we thought were lost. Yeah. Um, and restore that that film and make sure it isn't lost to time because it's it's part. I mean something as as simple and maybe as insignificant as the movie Nightbreed doesn't doesn't quite fit the level of, you know, the very first films ever made in no, in, but in, you, in the silent film era. But you know what I want to do? I want to call somebody up and say, you "Better fucking find those original versions of Star Wars before they're gone." <laughs> right. The time. But that's it. Yeah. That's just it. So so it's it's a, I think it's just a, an amazing story of of film preservation. Mm-hmm. This this whole well, thing. It's, it's art. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, how think of all all the pieces of art that's been lost to fire or lost to uh, well, as artists often did, paint over you know, their canvases or wipe out what they had done before. I mean, I think um, Van Gogh most of his paintings were Yeah. I mean, he he overdid yeah. them. And, and so there there are lost masterpieces that 
Well, I read, you'll never find. I read an article just the other day about um, when when MySpace deleted all of their old profiles and blogs, mm-hmm. like everything that had been produced in in in, in so on their social media site before they rebranded everything. Like they just, they just smoked all of it. Mm-hmm. It's gone. There's there's untold amounts of of conversations and pieces of art and poetry and music and whatever that was shared well, and relationships and that yeah that and, and, yeah that would that was shared on that site mm-hmm. that is just it's gone it will never be retrieved um it's almost like an entire history of the internet was cut out and destroyed right i mean you know it's like the people always like to go to the wayback machine and see old versions of websites, but sometimes things are not recoverable. It's just not there. They're not there. Yep. Um, those things are gone and nobody saved a copy of it and yep. nobody has a copy of it. Um, you know, I mean, there are, you know, I mean, this is something kind of getting off topic here, but yeah, I wrote over a thousand articles on a website, you know, that isn't there anymore. Ugh. You know, and I mean, I, I, it might be there in the Wayback Machine, but I mean, I almost hate to find out that it isn't. You right. Know? Right. Um, yeah, I was because I, I've done some good stuff on there. Yeah. You know? But oh. the but I mean it's that's that's the word. I mean yeah. I mean you want things like this, good, bad, or indifferent. You want to make sure that not only the artist intentions are represented, but that that what was actually there is still there and, and survives and, and lives throughout history and. That's kind of, in some ways, why we kind of do live at a kind of a great time, because there are there that does exist that that the the attempt to try to save that stuff still is there, uh-huh. you know. And um, for some people, some of their uh, original ideas or original versions will not be retrieved until after they die, you know, and because somebody's going to stumble upon. Oh, what's on this blank videotape? Well, the, oh I, my God, it's the fucking ring. The, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Clyde Barker just spilled us all. I'm surprised that wasn't. Yeah, one <laughs> right. of the tapes of Clyde Barker's closet. Yeah, it's the but fucking it's, ring. But it's it's like a, the the imagine the possibilities of what was in Prince's fucking vault and mm-hmm. in Paisley Park. I mean, I love that. I love that yeah, idea right. that that there is, there are things that have been preserved that we haven't seen, or things that that have not been preserved that can be found. Right. Um, uh, the the whole idea of re- the film restoration, like what vinegar vinegar syndrome is doing with like the golden age of erotica, is mm-hmm. even fascinating. Like, oh yeah, like that that may may seem like trash and may seem like um, uh, just well, it's it was, garbage uh, to, to some people, but it's you're talking about the stuff from like the seventies, yeah, like, like, porno like sheet. yeah, like like yeah. yeah, like the old John Holmes stuff, yeah. you know, the, the stuff the, that the played Johnny in Chins actual and, fucking theater, right? I mean that yeah. that is a piece of history, and love it or hate it, it's part of our collective it, it, history. It, it deserves to be preserved. Yeah, yeah. I think we kind of did this. <sighs> we did. We yeah, did it. I we did we it. Kind of did. And did I I still offer you the the challenge. Yeah. Of, of Think about you know putting something together that talks a little bit more about the or other movies that that, uh-huh. that this, but I mean you have a a pool. I mean I see your notes for yeah. this movie. <laughs> I mean you have the knowledge and you have the information. You well, have I think the, it, I think an interesting thing to maybe discuss um, in the uh, in after in overtime or whatever that might be is is definitely the, the different versions of the cuts and and how they kind of play and. And the difference is the, the good and the bad with the cabal cut because there's a lot of people out there who feel like that's the best version of the movie, and I don't agree at all. Um, there's there's I mean, more to the movie, but I think that there are good things about it that ever, I do understand why if you've seen it and then you, you don't have access to it again, that it's a little painful. Um, sure, but that's just that's an alternate version. That's an alternate reality of that movie. It'd be like finding out there, uh, there are scenes that were cut out that can be restored into 2001: A Space Odyssey. Right. Do we really need more to which, that movie? Which, which didn't they find some? I, I think, think so. they found but, some footage. But we yeah. don't need. No, that. we don't. I mean, it is. It's already <laughs> mind blowing, isn't it? We right. don't need. I, I want to see more. it, but I don't want to see it in the movie. Exactly. Yeah. Um, now, um, yeah. I mean, I challenge you to that. Um, it's an almost an interesting juxtaposition with something like Blade Runner as well. 
where we have very different opinions of, of the different versions of Blade Runner. I that get, I, that's a fun conversation. I think that's we'll, that, we'll have that. I think that's a conversation that parallels Nightbreed in some ways for for fans of of these different cuts. Right. Um, but anyway, Although yeah. I know I'm on the I'm on the the, the minority. I kind of have a hybrid approach to what I like about the the different versions of Blade Runner, but yeah. um yeah. We'll we'll t- we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get there. But uh, I'm going to uh, give this a rating. Yes. Um, out of five uh, unmarked Clyde Barker VHSs, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'll give this movie. Uh, I'll give it four. I mean, it's a solid movie. It's it's a it's a it's not my favorite of his. Um, it's not even my favorite of this month. Mm-hmm. But it's a very solid movie. I I think this is a movie that is almost hurt by the fact that it didn't have the opportunity to expand on these ideas. Yeah. In, in film. Now, granted, I could read those comics, and God knows I read comics. Um, but th- th- that's not quite the same. In some ways, I'm sure some of that is retconning a little bit and tweaking things a little bit. Yeah. Not necessarily what we would have seen if this grew into a series of some sort. Um, I don't think I need to ask you how many unmarked VHSs. Well, well yeah. I'm actually going to rate this on a scale of five torn nipple rings. Oh, my God. There are yeah. torn nipple rings. Yeah. And, and, you know, <laughs> as much as I would love to give it five torn nipple rings, uh, that's kind of reserved for, for what I would feel is a perfect film. and With, with a perfect ripped nipple. With a perfectly ripped nipple where it just gets... Straight ripped out. Straight you know? ripped out. Not yeah. much mess. No fuss. Yeah, no mess. exactly. Real, yeah. real quick and real quick and quick and. Yeah, it's almost still unpainful. almost at almost first. Un- un- painful. Un- <laughs> Painless. I'm gonna say four and a half because a, yeah. because there are. I, I even mentioned them in, in this podcast and while I watch the movie. There, there are some. There are scenes that parts. I have problems with. Some wonky parts that don't quite go right, and I would love to see change. And I do believe that there are parts of the Cabal cut that are improvement on the director's cut. So well, we talked about Panaka, him him specifically. Guy. So yeah, so four and a half for me. I, I love this movie though. I'll talk to anybody about this for for an additional eight million hours. Um, yeah. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, watch it. Um, if you want to watch it with me, tell me and we'll watch it. I've got all three cuts, and I might get some weirdos with with unmarked VHS tapes, but and rip nipples. But uh, um, if you're in Indianapolis specifically and you don't have a copy of the Cabal cut. And you would like to watch the Cabal Cut? Let me know. Well, um, let's talk about some things that we have on the horizon. Next week, we have our first ever requested or, or suggested movie, I should say. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that when uh, on Facebook oh, as God. we get to that. I'm really excited for it's, this. One. It's fantastic. It, yeah, it's a real um, treat. The um, which is funny because we actually recorded that episode in continuity terms. We've actually already recorded that. Yes, episode. yes. But um, uh, you know, we've got uh, Facebook, we've got uh, Instagram, we've got Tumblr and Twitter. You can follow us there. We've got stuff that's uh, being posted on the website all the time. I already kind of mentioned that I'm, uh, you know, got got some monster business going on there that we're uh, putting out there. Yep. Um, Mail us a um, self-addressed stamped Manila envelope. And we will send back an unmarked VHS tape. <laughs> <laughs> With some weird shit on it. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, one of the things we've kind of been hinting at all uh, month, um, Hellraiser 1 and 2. Obviously, those are big, big, big Clive Barkers. They're the centerpiece. They're the centerpiece. They're, they're what people come for. The... Um, we are going to talk about them, but we're saving them until October. We've got uh, five episodes in October to fill. Uh, just so happens that uh, Mr. Barker's birthday is uh, the very first uh, week of October, so we're going to cover it then. Happy birthday, uh, Clive. Happy birthday, Clive. Um, I can't wait to see more uh, nipple torture. Yes. There will be plenty of that. There are plenty of sexual torture, and uh, I'm kind of kind of down for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to watch it. it. Um Please don't ask for any uh, unmarked VHS tapes <laughs> because probably a lot of it's going to be shit you do not want to see. I could send them home videos from when I was like eight. It would be hilarious. It would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah. 
Actually, let's do an episode of that. <laughs> the, uh, so anyway, uh, let's let's wrap things up. We're gonna put the bow on uh, Barker Bonanza. Barker Bonanza. Hope uh, you enjoyed it. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, we've got plenty of more um, things to talk about. Plenty of more. Uh, 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 themes and stuff like that that we'll get to. This was our first real big theme uh, that that was more than just a series of movies yep. or, or loosely connected movies in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but until next week when we will talk about The Rage, yes. and we'll let you figure out what the fucking version of The Rage, because <laughs> there's every movie in the mid-90s was called The Rage. I like that. It's kind of like a film seizure uh, scavenger hunt. Scavenger hunt. You figure out which the rage from the late 90s we're going to talk about <laughs> um and we will reveal that to you next week but i am jeff arbuckle i'm jason oliver and thank you for listening we'll see you next week I've cleaned up a lot of breeders. Families like cesspools. Filth making filth making filth. And, and I did it over and over and over again. But it was all leading me here. I was born to destroy Boone and the breed together. You're crazy. No, I'm death. Plain and simple.